All right, welcome to episode nine of This Week in Rockford, taped December 21st, 2016. We're excited to have with us Aaron Tokars. Is that a fair pronunciation? It is, thank you. All right, and coming up after him is Alderman Vanita Hervey. Aaron is a candidate for the second Ward Aldermanic position in Rockford. So, what made you want to do that? Oh, boy. Um, we, my wife and I, we moved to Rockford about 10 years ago, into the second ward. And now, you were a police officer in Gurney, right? I was before this, yes. Uh, I spent 11 years in Gurney as a police officer. I uh, did seven years as a road officer, a street officer, and then I did three years of undercover narcotics. Oh, wow. And uh, our transition, we moved out to Rockford, uh, like I said, 10 years ago, and have absolutely fallen in love with the community. And uh, four years ago, I had contemplated putting my, uh, my name in the hat as a, for the position of alderman. And at the time, our, our youngest child had just been born, and uh, my wife very wisely suggested that I wait. Um, so, uh, yes. as of, as of this fall, all of our kids are in school full time and, um, I, I, I really want to see what I can do to help this community. And that's I think fantastic. that's the first step. So now you were a police officer. Now you have a business, yes. white shutter photography. That is correct. And tell us about that. So my wife and I started the business, uh, about a year after we moved here to Rockford. Uh, I've been, had an interest in photography for about 25 years. And, uh, when we moved here, it was a, it was a uh, change of careers for me. Um, I had taken a, a medical retirement from the police department, and uh, after being here for about a year, we put our heads together and said, what can we do here in the community? And uh, we uh, decided to get into wedding photography. Uh, now, ask me 10 years ago if I was going to be a wedding photographer, or 20, 15 years ago, I'd say, I, absolutely no way. Um, but it's, uh, it's a great thing for us. We get to be involved with people on one of the happiest days of their lives. And for my wife and I, we get to go and do something together every Saturday night. So it's kind of like our date night. We get to go to a new person's yeah. wedding every weekend. <laughs> and, um, and, and we've made a business out of it. So it's so great. Part of your credential will be an alderman, then, would, or credentials would be uh, that you're a small business person. You have yes. a police background. I would think uh, in Rockford that could be pretty uh, on point with some of the things an alderman may face. Yes. In terms of decision making. What other things should we know about you in terms of qualifications? Um, I think I, I'm, I'm going to go back to the police officer just for a minute, if you don't mind. Oh, sure. Um, I, I, my, the big thing I'm, the, the biggest thing that I think I can bring to the community is that uh, I believe that if we have safer streets. We're going to have a stronger community, and uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about neighborhood involvement and economic growth and economic development. And I am on board with all those things as well. But being a resident of Rockford for the last ten years, I've noticed it's always crept in the back of my head. Am I safe being out in the street? Am I safe going to the grocery store? Am I safe going downtown? Am I safe at other places in town, in my, in my alley, wherever? Um, now, I do feel safe here in Rockford. Uh, I've always had my eye open, um, but I do feel <coughs> like it's a safe community. But I think the message we need to get out to the, to the other residents and other people in the area is Rockford is a safe place. Let's go downtown. Let's come into town. Let's you know, come to the different businesses and build a community. Uh, and having the law enforcement background... Uh, again, I don't think, and I am not going to proclaim that I'm going to solve all of Rockford's mm -hmm. crime problems by being an alderman, not at all. But I have a uh, deep respect for Chief O'Shea and the things that he's going to be doing. What other parts are there of your uh, campaign platform or things that you want to move the ball on or move the needle on, as everybody likes to say now? in terms of your ward? Uh, specifically in the ward, I think we need more business. Um, we have a generally the second ward. Let's dial out for a second. Sure. The second ward, um, uh, it actually covers quite a span north to south. Uh, it runs south of state down to almost Broadway, am I thinking, at one point? Yes. And then it runs as far north, it runs north of Rural and over to Alpine. And, and up into the, include the Edgebrook uh, area as well. So yeah. it, is a, it is a very spread out area. Uh, Geographically diverse yes. and demographically diverse ward. I think that's true for a lot of them. Um, but just to give people a sense of it, I mean, I think Rural Oaks, is that in your ward? Actually, Rural Oaks is just outside of our ward. Okay. And it would be just... So would that be the third ward? No. Uh, just west of yes. your ward? Okay. Correct. Yeah, and that would there's be a, the third There's ward. just a little sliver right there that, uh, that is not in the ward. But gotcha. uh, that, whole, that, that general area, yes. Okay, so a little bit east of there yep. is... Uh, part of your war. Yes. So anyway, you were saying more business. Well, and with the more business, there is a big push for 
uh, development in the downtown area, and I, I, I love it. Uh, nine years ago when we did come here, we'd go to walk downtown on a, any night, and there was hardly anything going on, and we've seen really that growth in Rockford starting with the downtown. Uh, specifically in the second ward, though, I'd like to see more of that development along the uh, Charles Street corridor, and even if we can get some more businesses in that area, that would be just wonderful, and to help the businesses already there start to branch out and, and get a little better and bigger. What part of Charles Street is in the second ward? So uh, basically from where uh, Swed Swedish American Hospital is, mm -hmm. um, down Charles Street all the way down to Rockford Avenue. So the Walgreens oh, there, uh, okay. kitty corner from uh, Swedish American Pan. Okay, so just about, yeah, all right, gotcha. So just about... Um, to Stockholm in. Yes. Just uh, Stockholm in, just on the other side. Stockholm in would be right outside the ward, and gotcha. uh, the Walgreens side would be in the is ward. Is in so. the ward. Okay. And that is a, that is a, there's a great stretch of uh, land right there in the street, and there's already some businesses and some, um, you know, uh, smaller developments that are allowed there that I think that we could build up and, and hopefully get some better business in there into the second ward. Gotcha. We have... A Republican incumbent, Jamie Getchis, yes. is the alderman. Uh, we have three Democratic candidates. What is your, I guess I'll ask you to compare yourself both to the uh, incumbent, supposing you come out of the primary, and to the existing, uh, to the other Democratic candidates that you'll face in the primary. What, what should we know about you relative to them? Um, the first thing I would say, and this would be to the incumbent, um, I know that I am definitely way available. And when I say that, uh, being a business owner here in town, uh, our business location is actually right on our property. We have a studio behind our house. So, uh, you know, Monday through Friday during the week, and, you know, I am in town, I am available, and, you know, to meet the needs of, of the residents and of the people of the ward. So if you have an issue during the week on a Tuesday afternoon at 10 o'clock and you give me a call, I am here in town um, you know, I have a, since I am a small business owner and I make my own hours, and since all the kids are in school now, I have the availability that if you do have an issue on your street or there's something going on and you need to talk to me in person, I think it's always better to talk to somebody in person than just blast an email out. So if I can get over there and be there for you, hopefully we can get the issue solved or at least we can get a conversation about it. Um, and I know that, uh, you know, I, I'm well aware of, you know, Jamie's position and what he does uh, for a career, and, and I applaud him for that. There's nothing wrong with that, but it does put him geographically outside of Rockford for a substantial amount of time. So uh, to the incumbent, that's what I'd say that I could definitely... Have, have there been challenges with that? Because I, I, I know some people in that ward, I, they have, I mean, that's never been a discussion for me. Uh, people trying to get a hold of him can't get a hold of him. Or are you just saying that if he's okay, you'll be even better? I'm just I'm saying that if he's okay, I will be even better. Okay. Yes, I'm I'm I, I can't speak for all the people of the ward, of course, but <laughs> yes. Uh, and as far as uh, to the other challengers, um, I've I've met one of the challengers, um, and uh, I have not met another, the other one. Uh, I've met Mr. Loberman. He's a fantastic individual as a as a school teacher. Um, you know, I think he could definitely bring a lot to the table as well. Wait, we need more incivility. This doesn't give us ratings when you say he's a good <laughs> yeah, guy. That doesn't, I'm teasing. <laughs> That's uh, it's refreshing to hear. So well, I, you know, how would you compare th yourself to him? Well, again, um, going based ba back on the law enforcement background, I think I can bring that to the table. And, and um, again, building the community, I think, starts with being safe. And if I can, whatever I can do within city council to be supportive of law enforcement, uh, I'm going to be there for them. And I will definitely be an advocate for the law enforcement here. Uh, police officers from Rockford is also... Uh, you know, we also bring in state police sometimes to do joint task force and sometimes even the, you know, federal bureaus. So um, I think that if we can partnership up, you know, in Rockford and build our police force, that's going to be a, do a great thing for the entire community as well as the second ward. When you were a Gurney police officer, did you live within the village boundaries there? Uh, Gurney, I did not. Okay. I lived in the very next town over. I lived in one any, town over. Do you have any thoughts on whether that's something we should be looking at in Rockford? I know somebody near us once had some thoughts on that. <laughs> um, <Me> still, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's it's tough to. Sometimes it can be tough to live in the town. Um, I didn't. For, for in in Gurney, it was also different because Gurney is was. Um, it, it butted up next to a whole bunch of other communities. You know, where Rockford is kind of its own community here. Uh, in the big county, um, and I think in a geographical area like that, where. Uh, 
the uh, house value or you know medium home value in in Gurney was uh, quite a bit higher. So as a police officer, it was sometimes hard for the newer officers to live inside of town. They'd have to go outside of town to find more economical housing. Gotcha. Uh, in Rockford, though, we have those options. Um, one of the things I know that I, I think is a great idea, I don't know if all of the officers would agree with, with me on this, but is that whole thing of living in the community that where you're working, um, you know, it gives you a better sense of community with the other residents. And I think that's great. All right. Uh, I want to make sure we talk about your <clears throat> events because uh, I know you've got those before we go. So if I don't bring it back up, please do. But I don't want to hog all the time here. You got any questions first? Yeah, yeah. Um, on that note, um, law enforcement, uh, police living in the communities. I talked to a lot of people who who remember the days where they had a you know an Officer Jones living on their blocks. And um, I mean, how do you incentivize? Um, maybe a police force to, to kind of get back to that. Is it possible in today's day and age? Because, I mean, I mean, let's face it, this isn't 1965 anymore. We've got some different problems in 2016. But, um, I mean, how big of a necessity would you think it is or is not for police officers to maybe get back to the more neighborhood type of beats? Specifically for neighborhood beats, I think it's a great idea because I do think that if you start to learn your officer or you're going to learn your neighborhood officer and who he is or who she is, you're going to have a more of a uh, relationship with them where you can you don't mind calling the police and you can call them on things having that relationship with them. Specifically living in the community, that's a really tough sell. It's a tough sell to the officers. It's a tough sell sometime even to the, to, even to the residents sure. of the community. Um, again, I think it's a great idea. As far as making it happen, that's, that's, that's a tough one. But as far as the officers being within their beat, um, you know, in, in staying in that beat, when I was in Gurney, it's a much smaller community, but our town was divided up into four beats. And you got to know who your business owners were. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and again, that comes down to the individual officer and training and, and how, how you're perceived. But the more you can get out as an officer out of your car, walking the beat, whether it be you know, uh, an old school style of just get, getting out of your car and walk in the neighborhood and talking to kids and talking to residents that, that, you know, where you're not perceived as a threat is, yeah. is really a huge thing, especially in the, in the times that we're living in now. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> obviously safety and law enforcement and things like that, it's our huge, is a huge topic in Rockford. What's kind of the next biggest issue that you see, um, as far as your ward and just overall, I guess, what's another thing, another issue that you see that um, you know, you could help, help out with, I guess. Uh, I, I think being a small business owner is going to help. Um, you know, when we started here uh, in Rockford nine years ago, we didn't have any idea what we were doing. Um, and I say that we knew that we wanted to be photographers, but as far as, um, you know, having somebody help us out, um, uh, again, I, I it not necessarily, is it, is it necessarily the, you know, the city's responsibility to help out a new business owner to hold their hand. I don't think that's it. But I think that there are steps that as as a community, we can kind of embrace and welcome, be a little more welcoming to businesses who are coming into town and also to new business owners. If there's a way that we can coach them along, um, guide them, guide new businesses to how things are done and or at least point them in the right direction, that would be very helpful. Um, and the other thing I would say is education. Uh, I do know that as a city councilman, it's not technically my responsibility to, to make changes for Rockford, you know, for the schools, but uh, the school system is on the right direction. Um, and I just, I want to try to be supportive to the schools as well, as much as we can. We have five children that are in the public, uh, public schools here, and we love it. Um, you know, unfortunately, in the past, Rockford has gotten a bad rap with a lot of things. But, uh, you know, I definitely say our, you know, the public schools are doing a phenomenal job with their, the change in the education system. And being a part of that, I think, again, the more supportive we can be as a community to RPS 205 can be better. All right. Well, I want to honor your time commitment. I know you have something backed up to this. Where can we find you online? So you can find me at a few different places. Uh, the first would be our website is friendsofarentokars.org. Why don't you spell out your name so that everybody's got that straight, especially if they're listening rather than at the computer with uh, Absolutely. So it would be Friends of Aaron, A-A-R-O-N, Tokars, T-O-K-A-R-Z, dot org. And we can also be found on Facebook, same thing. Friends of Aaron Tokars, and also on Twitter at Aaron underscore Tokars. Same spelling. Any chance for people to meet you? Absolutely. 
So twice a month, right now, we are hosting an event called Coffee and a Candidate, and it is being hosted uh, by Louise Posca at Posca on State Street, and that is on the first and third Wednesday of every month at nine in the morning, and we are going to be adding on some evening ones as well. And if you want to check up on our Facebook or Twitter feed, you can definitely find more information about that. Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining yep. us, Aaron. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. All right. We're back from the break. We have with us Alderman Vanita Hervey from the Fifth Ward. Alderman, thanks for coming down. Thanks for having me. I um, didn't know this was here until I talked with Jim, so it's All really right. nice to see that we're, we've got a venue. We're excited to have you. Yeah, we like to have old conversations venue here about stuff. and reasonable facsimile. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there, um, we got yes. something. We had something. It's still a little chilly in here, but I tell you what, if you compare notes with Alderman McNamara, it's probably twice as warm in here as it was last time. It was he four is, outside and, like, what, in here? Yeah. Six? Well, according to him, it was less than four, but I the water <laughs> wasn't frozen, so I, okay. I don't know what to Oh, yeah. Well, if the water's running, it's, you know, that's right. heat wave. So. That's right. It's a heat wave. So, Alderman, how long have you been doing that? Being this is the eighth is. year. Eighth this year. is my, uh, I'm finishing up my second, second term, term and asking uh, residents of the Fifth Ward to give me a third. All right. Now, what do you do besides Alderman? I know this answer, but a lot of people I'm an may attorney not. by in, in private practice. Um, I practice primarily civil rights law. Um, I did some small business development. I represented at one time about 40 independent truckers. That was the most fun that I've had. And organizing small businesses. That was just, uh, there are several that grew into medium-sized businesses, uh, manufacturing and um, yeah, primarily more manufacturing and production-oriented businesses. Those were a lot of fun uh, and, and, and feel good. Um, but I also focus quite a bit on education law. I worked on the People Who Care discrimination case uh, against the Rockford Public Schools for about, what, six and a half years, um, then went into to private practice. And right now I am a hearing officer for the Rockford Public Schools. I do some of the, almost all of their discipline hearings, uh, residency challenges, grievances, um, that parents may have if they've been barred from the schools or they have just a general grievance against the district. Um, and I still do some uh, advanced directives planning, um, things like that. Wills, small trusts, I don't handle big trusts, but primarily things like powers of attorney for health care and property. Um, especially in lower income communities, people just don't do those things. Uh, I don't know whether sure. it's not accessible or it's just not known. I would guess there's an. Ex I would guess it's a combination of both. Certainly yeah. an accessibility factor. But it's a I huge issue when people pass away. Very often, yeah. um, everything ends up getting eaten up in probate exactly. or in attorney's fees. Yeah. So I'm trying to tell people that there are tools out there uh, that you can use. So. I want to do more of that so people can hold on to their estates better. Well, that's fantastic. Well, not for the attorneys, but it's fantastic. <laughs> fantastic for your clients and yes, they, uh, it is. their loved ones, for sure. So, Alderman, uh, in your time in office, you've had the opportunity to uh, be involved with some things that have sparked some conversations. Yes. Um, we were just talking with Aaron Tokars. You were in the, uh, the lovely not warm green room over there and yeah. you heard you heard the conversation with Aaron about having police officers uh, and I would say firefighters live in the community. Yeah, it's more of an issue for me and and I've been very very vocal about that. Um, Where did that whole thing go? Because you were a proponent of that. You brought that forward and said we should require that they live here for, what, six months before they be... No, uh, we can't require anything. That's a state law. Oh, One of the biggest we can't. obstacles that we have to management within the city of Rockford with our police and firefighters, I call them our public safety officers, is that even though their salaries, 100% of their pensions are funded locally, the rules, uh, the provisions, the benefits, all of those things are decided at the state level. They have very powerful unions, more power to them. I don't blame the unions, I blame the legislators who allow themselves to be influenced by the contributions, uh, by the favoritism, and I have huge issues with that. So we had a residency requirement years ago, um, and also the arbitration system. After you bargain for so long, they take something to arbitration. So state law opened it up, and it made uh, residency a, a mandatory topic of collective bargaining. Mm -hmm. So if it's mandatory, 
it's on the table. And arbitrators tend to favor those things that the unions ask for. So we lost residency in Rockford. Chicago still has it because it's a permissive subject of bargaining in Chicago. So both sides have to agree. Gotcha. Mm. So this is actually a function of the collective bargaining agreement. Absolutely. And, and we have the weaker hand in negotiating on that generally and on that specific issue. Because it became a statutory subject of collective bargaining. How, how Prior long to ago, that, it was not. How long ago did that happen? It was in the 80s. I can't remember if it was 89, 88, I think somewhere in there. But it's been quite a while. My issue with it is that when almost 70% of your public safety force, which is about 80% of our, our budget, between 75 and 80% of our budget, all in, um, a huge piece of our public employee pension systems. When that wealth leaves your city, it makes a huge sucking sound. And we need that wealth within the city of Rockford. We need their expertise, we need their professionalism. It makes a difference in the core of your community. So when that level of education, that level of professionalism, um, and money, those are nice middle-class jobs. When 500 what, of them leave the city every day uh, and go up to Rockton and Roscoe and Byron and Oregon and all of these places, um, it has a huge impact on the community. It creates a lot of distrust. I think a lot of citizens believe, at least where I live and people of my hue, if you will, in the minority community, people believe when you move to small, predominantly white communities, some of which are pretty hostile, you know, a lot of black folks still talk about uh, not going up into Roscoe and Rockton. Uh, you get stopped, you get pulled over, you get questioned. So when our officers live there, it makes people suspicious that they are part of that mentality that does <clears throat> not want an African-American core or influence. And Rockford is the urban core of Winnebago County. So we have a higher minority percent percentage. We have a higher poverty level. We get a lot of what I call urban burdens, homelessness, uh, crime, if you will, uh, public housing uh, that brings its own set of concerns. Uh, that's what Rockford is. And I think a lot of people reject that and don't want it, so they look down on Rockford. Do you think that our police force reflects uh, demographically our community? No, it doesn't. But it's doing a whole lot better than Winnebago County. And I think they're <laughs> yeah, working think on it very, very hard. I've never... You're pleased with the progress, it sounds like? I'm pleased, not the progress so much, but the effort that they're putting out there. Okay. Look, at one point, we were graduating fewer than 35% of African-American boys from the Rockford Public Schools. So when you have that demographic and you juxtapose that with uh, the heightened testing requirements for police officers, um, the, per the, the level of professionalism, you know, the skills that you need, uh, it used to be all you had to be was a beat cop, you know, walk around and swing your baton and, and, and say, hey, how you doing? Now you have to have data savvy. Um, you have to have technical savvy. Your writing skills have to be at a higher level. I remember when people used to joke about uh, police reports uh, in law school. Uh, mm. Some of the prosecutors would say, you know, your biggest nightmare was having to ask someone to read a piece of a police report. And they would say, who wrote this? It's kind of still <laughs> like that. And in some places, yeah, it is still like that. But um, that's disappearing. And the professionalism and the level of competence that's required is much higher. So we missed a lot of that because I think we have such uh, a dearth of achievement in the minority community, especially African American within our school system. Another issue that you've been vocal on or were vocal on uh, would be Newtown. Yes. Yes. Not uh, just Newtown, public housing period. Tell us your thoughts. Public housing was supposed to be, when it was created, a, a safety net for people. It was supposed to give primarily women and children a place where they could go if women were divorced, if a husband died and they didn't have insurance, um, injury, disability. That's what public housing was for. It was not supposed to be a multi-generational way of life. 
And what has happened, and I'm going to talk about the black community because that's what I've seen, is that it has become an entrapment for people. Um, children are in these ghettos, and they are ghettos. I am sorry. They don't like to hear it called that, but it's a ghetto. And it's a breeding ground for crime. Uh, the, the very way that they're made up encourages gang activity and gang formation. We already know these things. It's not, it's not surprising. They've been doing research on this for 40, 50 years, but yet we're still building the same thing. Uh, the Rockford Housing Authority wants to rebuild Orton Keys in its same size. And they said, well, this will be the first time that we've put significant development into Orton Keys. No, it's not. It's the third. I remember when Orton Keys was first built, it was called Locomo Heights. And it's actually sure. smaller. Tommy Meeks uh, told us about that. Yeah, now. smaller yeah. than what Orton Keys <clears throat> is now. Then they built it to what it is today. Now they're going to do the third iteration, and somehow we're supposed to expect something different. You know, what's the solution? What what stops the cycle, or what breaks the pattern there? Two things. Number one, um, it has to become a shorter term solution to help families get back on their feet. Uh, there has to be a demand that if you are in public housing, you are either in education or job training something to improve your life. Not if you're disabled, not if you have a chronic illness, but I'm talking about people who are able-bodied. Maybe they need soft skills. Maybe they need to go back to school. This is especially true of women if they had children at a very young age, but it cannot be a place for multi-generational um, sighting. It just can't. Okay, so one issue is kind of working on the person, so to speak, or having things that the person is doing that helps them move on, move out of there. Right. Is there a second prong to the solution? Yes, the way they're built. And that's what, we're, that's what the big fight is about. Even within HUD, Housing and Urban Development, there's one that says that concentrated poverty and racial isolation are bad. And I happen to believe that. Um, I don't think there's a way that you can perpetuate segregated housing and say, it's going to be segregated housing, but we're going to make it good. Um, it doesn't work. And the, what I call, large-scale, high-density design. You cannot pack poor people into those kinds of settings and expect an outcome that's different than what we have today. Gang formation, um, a sense of hopelessness. Um, we used to have a phrase, we would call it, see ghetto, be ghetto. When all children see is poverty and all they hear is a certain way of speaking, a certain way of, of behaving, uh, and a certain way of living, that becomes normal to them. And normal should not be what we're asking of our children in these housing developments. So I believe they have caused significant harm and breakdown to the African-American family. You know, we used to call them daddy checks. They used to go through uh, public housing and scattered site housing and Section 8 housing to see if there was evidence that a man was in the house. And if there was evidence of a man, they would cut off the woman's benefits. So when black men were saying, we're being discriminated against in the workplace, we want to work, we want to take care of our families, they could get no takers, they could get no support. Mm -hmm. um, but yet, everybody was right there to give us free food, uh, free help if you had another baby, free housing. All you had to do was get the man out of your house and out of your life. And I think public housing and welfare had a huge impact on the breakdown of the African-American family. That is not a popular view. Um, I get criticized for it from all sides, and I really don't care. I watched it happen. Uh, I watched black men offer to leave their families so that their children could get medical care. When that's the economically rational choice, I, you know, that's exactly I, uh, that's what, what you, you would do. do. I would and that's exactly what <laughs> happened. Yes. So I want to flip that equation right. um, in its entirety. It's going to take time to do it, but you can't build another 60-year housing development like Orton Keys and say that we're going to work to make it better. It, it seems to me that there's a... Um, um, 
It seems to me that there there may be a challenge, but I guess the question is how do how do you um, fix it on the local level when when you have an organization like HUD who is who who is just kind of exponentially um, you know, continuing the, this system that that was created and there there are hard facts to support um, y your position that these housing developments long term don't work because I kind of look at like a car, like a new car they're all nice when they're new. Um, but, but there's always a, a time where, you know, you, you have to, you know, either trade that thing in or, 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 you know, send it to the scrapyard. And over and over again, I see even in Rock, but I've only been here 21 years and I've seen the deterioration of not only these buildings, but the people who are living there, the conditions just seem to get worse and worse and it becomes now another generation. So how do you, um, how do you fight a system like that locally when, when HUD, every time, it seems like every time somebody fights against something like this, you have HUD here threatening to sue you. That's exactly what we have right now. You know, they're conducting a so-called compliance review. And we've got Ron Kluwer and Rockford Housing Authority sort of partnering with HUD. And they have threatened to, and, and HUD's threat is pretty strong. They can take away not just your HUD funding, but all federal funding. And they love to remind you of that. That means money for roads, bridges, all of those things. And it's a scary proposition. Um, the other part is, who wants to pay for litigation? You know, it's going to cost right. millions of dollars to, to push this lawsuit. So what they're actually doing now is trying to force us into uh, what they call a voluntary compliance agreement. There's, a, there's nothing voluntary about it. <clears throat> Number two, <laughs> yeah. um, it's going to benefit RHA and Gorman. Because now what HUD is doing is partnering to privatize public housing. And that's a very toxic proposition. Partnering with Gorman? Private developers in Rockford, RHA, has given, I think, close to 1,000 units to, our, to Gorman Jeez. and company to, to redevelop. And it behooves Gorman to create these dense, packed, high-poverty concentrations of people because it's easier to manage. Um, they're easier for maintenance and repair. And the rest of us are saying, number one, reduce the numbers. Rockford has had an oversupply of, of low or what I call affordable housing and very housing for very low income people. In other words, public housing. Um, now they're moving to these rental assistance developments or RADs where they're pretty much voucher based, um, kind of like Section 8. So what we're going to see is Gorman building places like Newtown, uh, the more the better. You know, we negotiated them down to, what, 49 units. They wanted 70. See, people forget that. Gorman wanted to build 70 units on that same site. So if you think 49 or 50 is too much, you should have seen it when the d design was for 70 in the same five acres. Um, Sounds like you have a dim <clears throat> view of Gorman. It's not so much a dim view of Gorman, it's a dim view of what Gorman represents. You could, you could associate, it, put in, or I'm sorry, substitute a name other than Gorman for that same okay, so kind it's, it's of no design. Animus, it's no animus directly against no animus Gorman as an entity, towards just, Gorman. just simply you think it's a bad system. It's a bad system, it's a bad design, it's a bad model. Um, I use the term poverty pimping. Um, that's what it is. Now it, I'm picturing Gary Gorman with a large purple hat on and a French coat. <laughs> well, you forgot the feather. Okay. Um, when I say poverty pimping, what I'm talking about is the more that people stay poor, and as a matter of fact, the design depends on people staying poor so that they stay in that housing because as long as they're poor, they get those vouchers. So there's almost an incentive not to move people up and out of poverty unless you have a steady stream, which brings us to whether Rockford has imported uh, a level of poverty into the city. And everybody says it's a myth that, you know, we brought people here from Chicago when Cabrini Green and mm -hmm. Alt Geld and Robert Taylor mm -hmm. and all those places were torn down. And it's absolutely true that we did. Um, during that time... Why did we do that? Because Chicago had a huge displacement factor. Right. They didn't have enough room, and we had <clears throat> excess capacity. In terms of occupancy, existing public housing, then? Public housing. Occupancy is the name of the game. 20 years ago, roughly, um, Concord Commons was probably close to 40 to 50% vacant. 
and Concord, Concord Commons filled up with people from Chicago. And the reason I know that is during People Who Care, I used to go out to Concord once a week and talk to people about uh, connecting with the schools, how to get involved in your kids' education. We would sit on the grass, and because Concord didn't have a community room. So we'd sit out on the grass and we'd talk about how to get your kids involved. And I'd usually bring something for lunch uh, or something of that sort, coloring books for the kids. And I'd ask, well, where are you from? What brought you to Rockford? Um, I used to go to Chicago two or three times a week, and there would be women getting on the bus with their household belongings wrapped in sheets. They didn't even give them the dignity of, of packaging their belongings and moving them over here. They'd put them on the bus and send them over here. There would be cabs waiting, and I would ask them, where are you going? And they said, I don't know. It's something called, and they would try to get the name. I'd say, Concord Commons? Yeah, that's it. And they had a piece of paper and they had a voucher for the cabs. So I know what we did. Now, of course, they're saying that doesn't happen anymore, but I think the damage was done. So many of those women were told that they could return to Chicago after the new housing was built. And I think there was a lot of resentment that they couldn't. Um, well, and I, the new housing that was built was all, all private development. Absolutely. It? And some of it's absolutely beautiful. Um, but it was some of it was market rate. So Chicago got mixed developments in a way that we did not. Do you, I have a question. Um, Jim, Jim mentioned um, how do you the federal how do you fight against that system the federal government of HUD coming down and saying that there's certain requirements that you have to abide by and things like that. Would the solution be to that be kind of scaling back RHA and you know their what they're trying to do? Would it be taking away what they're? I guess what they try to do would that be you know one aspect at it? At not as long as HUD is is in their corner, and believe me, they use it. Uh, Ron Kluwer uses it. We can tell on City Council that he has gone to HUD and complained about something that we did or something that we said because HUD has materials and letters that we didn't give to them. Now so for, it, it had to come from, from him. For people who don't know, how is uh, Ron Kluwer is uh, in charge of the RHA. Yes. He's the executive director? Or I think what, it's called the executive the director or CEO. Okay. or That's right. I think it's CEO. How is Kluwer selected for that job? His board hires him, and the board is appointed by the city council. Okay. And how many board members does he have? Ooh, well. Five? It's either five or seven, seven, but I believe it's five. Okay. So the city council indirectly has some influence on that position, but not direct. It does. And one of the things that I think that Rockford has such a problem with is that we don't manage or direct so many of the elements that have a huge impact uh, the education system is a good example. It has a separate board. Uh, they do their own thing. The housing authority is a separate municipal corporation. Um, we have agencies for tourism. We have all of these independent agencies that make decisions that directly impact uh, the city of Rockford. Yes, we have some input with some of them, like RHA and the Convention Bureau, with regard to appointment of board members. But that's it. On a day-to-day -day basis, on an operational basis, Rockford does not direct. Oh, the Board of Police and Fire Commissions chooses to hire and only they can terminate our chief of police and our chief of fire. If you could bring the school board or control of the school district within the municipal control, would you do it? Not now. Not in Rockford. I think it takes a lot of long-term planning. I think there could be a better partnership with the school district without the school district being a part of the municipal corporation. Would I you, kind of like it the way that it is. I think when that behemoth gets to be too big, it's not manageable. And I don't see the competence within the, the city of Rockford to manage anything bigger than what we have now. How about internally or internalizing some of those other things you mentioned, RACVB or RHA, or, or do you think... I do would believe. You, would you leave them outside and just try to exert more control? Because Alderman McNamara pointed out last week that I guess there are a bunch of unfilled or past due appointments for those board positions. Uh, exert better control that way, or would you bring them in-house? I would like to bring the housing authority in-house. Um, 
tourism, I think the way we kind of contract for it, again, I think it's a very specialized area. But housing has such an integral role in what happens within the city. And when they're directed by a federal agency that's outside of the city of Rockford, I think that's where the difficulty comes in because you lose that, to your point, that coordination and that influence. If we're not all on the same page and driving in the same direction, um, I don't think that's an issue with the school district. I don't think it's an issue with tourism. Um, it's not an issue with police and fire for the most part. Um, I wish they would take another look at some of their hiring requirements and some of their testing procedures. But with housing, it's a totally different animal. And when that is a separate and independent thought process, excuse me, and power, if you will, it has a huge impact. And we don't have a good relationship with RHA. If you know this answer, how does the county do it? Because I know there is public, uh, county-owned public housing. Do they, is that a direct position within the county? Or is it a similar structure to what RHA is? They, if you they know? have very little. Okay. They just don't have a lot. Um, and at one time, 85% of the county's Section 8 vouchers were housed within the city of Rockford. Ah, okay. So they got the money <clears throat> for it. They but just, it was Rockford's police, fire, ambulance services. Uh, when they tore down Champion Park and rebuilt it under the Hope 6 grant, Rockford annexed that entire Hope 6 development into the city of Rockford. What's the thought process there, like on an administrative level, as to why, you would want, why the city would want to annex that piece of property? It was done before I came on, and they said it was, there were several reasons, so they could have city water, and because of the low-income nature of most of the residents, so they could have city services. But, again, that's a huge burden on city services with almost no tax base right. in return. So I think there were just some bad decisions that were made um, that increased Rockford's poverty rate. And what I worry about most is Rockford becoming East St. Louis where the wealth of your city, remember in East St. Louis, almost 100% of their police and firefighters lived in St. Louis and Belleville and all of those places. And East St. Louis's entire tax base was taken up with um, city services. They had nothing left for streets, uh, for public improvement, for economic development. And that's where I see Rockford headed. And that's what frightens me. How do you stop it? I mean, what's the, how do you, at this point, I mean, if it's that far along, what's the big solution, I guess? I think first you have to get all of, all of us have to get on the same page with Rockford Housing Authority, with HUD, if that's where, and it is, the threat is coming from. Um, I think with our police and fire commission, city council, the mayor's office, and city leadership has to have a much more direct and ongoing conversation and day-to-day -day relationship with those agencies. If you've got 20 agencies that manage, you know, it's almost like having one that manages your heart, another one your liver, another one your stomach, another one your brain, and they're never coordinated. So the body itself doesn't work well because its parts aren't integrated, and we need to integrate our parts. And I think, I'm hoping we will do that with our next mayor. Do you have a preference on mayor, or is it something oh, yeah, you'd that, not that's like to share? No secret. I'm um, Team McNamara, if you will. All right. Um, I'm supporting Tom's candidacy, and I'm just very, very hopeful. I believe he has that philosophy. I think he's got the temperament. Um, you know, the first thing people say, well, wow, he's just so young. Uh, he's young, but he's, he's mature there's a big difference between the two and I think he's young but I think he's wise he's got some some good skill development and I think he's got a good I guess you could say as my mom would say head on his shoulders so I'm very optimistic about that now you've got a fight ahead of you you have a primary opponent I do I have a primary <coughs> challenger this All time right. around what can you tell us about that um, the only thing I know about him, I've only met him once. Uh, he came to a meeting. He's an investor, real estate investor. I believe he and his um, uh, wife or partner own about four or five properties. He lives in the ward, um, and they came here from Madison. That's about as much as I know. Uh, 
my goal in wanting to run again, nothing against him, um, there's some things I want to finish. What and do you want to finish? Barbara Coleman, South Main Street. Uh, South Main is two years behind, three technically. Um, I'm just starting to get some businesses. We have a service station coming. We've got Rock Valley College looking at Barbara Coleman Complex. We're working on the historic preservation and new market tax credits and other funding that could pay for almost 65 or 70 percent of the rebuild. That's going to bring development into that area. Um, I want a Rock Valley campus over here because I think it would help people tremendously in improving their educational skills and their marketability, job marketability. And we need that desperately in, in Southwest Rockford. So with the service station, healthcare, um, Mercy Rockford is going to gut Rockford Memorial Hospital, another thing I did that was not popular with people. Um, I recall that. I think you were called an obstructionist. I was an obstructionist. and I didn't call You know, that, the but. angry black woman, um, <laughs> which... You know, it just amazes me when you're fighting to keep health care for people and you're desperately trying to get someone to listen to you when they're blinded by $450 million, you have to fight hard. Yeah. And to lose the trauma center is going to be devastating. We're not just losing the trauma center, the cardiac cath lab. It's going to have a direct impact and impact on medical outcomes for people not just on the west side of Rockford, but in western Winnebago County. So I believe it's detrimental health care. Not just that. I think it has upset the balance of health care in Rockford. You know, we had three hospitals that were sort of evenly dispersed. Um, yes, Rockford Memorial had a higher Medicare-Medicaid ratio, um, but I believe you, you changed that by rebuilding your housing stock, rebuilding your wealth in the city. We've got more people downtown with a higher level of wealth. I think we can redevelop some of the areas, not just in Southwest Rockford, but around Southwest Rockford. And if we can get jobs back into the community, manufacturing, um, something other than call centers uh, that give and provide a livable wage, um, and a growth wage somewhere that you can grow, I think that's the answer to improving um, the mix of private pay versus um, government-funded uh, health care provisions. Well, do, you, do you foresee, I'm sorry, do you foresee, I mean, a problem I kind of see out of this, and I think you may have mentioned this in the past, I'd have to think about where I heard this from you, but uh, Rockford Memorial seems to me that it could um, ultimately become like a state-run hospital and th th those types of uh, um, institutions, unfortunately, still exist in, in bigger cities. And I, I believe the conditions are anything less or anything but, you know, I will advocate great. shutting it down. I do believe there's a, a and the, the phrase that I use, it's going to become Medicare, Medicaid, and minorities. And I think that's a recipe for separate but and, and unequal. I think it's going to choke Swedish American, you know, um, the leadership at Mercy Rockford has already pushed Crusader into right. taking all of their obstetrics away from Swedish American, which threatens Swedes residency program. This is just, it's not good for healthcare in Rockford. It could hurt St. Anthony. You know, what's going to happen to Swedes uh, emergency room when Rockford Memorial shuts down 47% of their beds? Right. They're going to get overwhelmed. So what's going to happen to people? Um, so all the poor women who go to Crusaders for their obstetrical care are now going to be forced to go out to Riverside to have their babies because they no longer have admitting privileges at Swedes. So we're going to have to do some things as a community. One, get the word out to those women that they have a choice. Um, you have a choice in where you go. You don't have to go to Crusader for your obstetrical care. Um, I'm not sure how all this works. I'm still learning the health care system. But I don't want a situation where poor people are kind of, as you said, cordoned into um, a second-rate medical facility. I don't believe the quality of services will stay the same. 
that's nothing against the doctors. I think they'll do as good a job as they can. But I don't believe that the investment in that hospital is going to be there to keep it a first-rate facility. Well, I think in Chicago that there are, are, are at least one state-run hospital where I think there's, I think they still use wooden beds. Oh, I mean, <laughs> and, and unfortunately, this really is a reality in, in the United States, and it, and 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 there, these buildings are located in now poor areas that used to be, you know, kind of first-rate. T- types of um, uh, areas. They have those old wooden wheelchairs. When I first went to Cook County Hospital, mm-hmm. a friend's mother was ill, and they had those wooden wheelchairs. That was when I was at U of I, so yeah, that was about 35, 40 years ago. But I was appalled at the facilities, um, and I just couldn't believe that that was actually a hospital. I should have done this earlier, but let's remind everybody where the Fifth Ward lies. It kind of straddles the river and runs south down Main Street. Um, I straddle the river. The best way to decide it, 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 from the west, it's bypass 20. To the east, I go up to Kishwaukee. To the north, um, I go up to the railroad tracks um, that separate the Orchid, the old Rockford College neighborhood, Mm -hmm. from... um, Hate Village, and in the north to South Main, I go up to Cedar Street. Okay. Um, to the south on Kishwaukee, I go all the way down to the um, uh, Reclamation District, just before you get to uh, Sandy Hollow Road. Yeah, so, Reclamation's what, 3,300 south or 3,500 yes. south? So, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's right. huge. That's Yeah, that's again a... And I go down to the bypass on South Main. Pretty wide geographic mm-hmm. swath there. Yeah. I know one of the things in your district, or in your ward, rather, uh, that uh, somebody on the show has mentioned from time to time is the Ziak building. Caleb's mentioned that a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Caleb, yeah. have you been talking about I the Ziak building? Very little. Wow. Now, Alderman, I think you were uh, one of the people who was a little skeptical about the plan to redevelop the building. Uh, What do we say sitting here at the end of 2016? Skeptical of the financing. Um, You know, again, it's one of those areas. I had someone ask me the other day, did you make a mistake? Were you wrong to support the project? And the easy answer would be yes, you know, and just jump in. I wanted to see the hotel, and I think there's some huge potential there. But I didn't want the city to spend the money that we did because I did not trust Gorman's financing. Um, You know, we made South Main, uh, we did the two-way conversion, and we took out what I call the Wyman Street curve. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't remember how many millions that cost. And we took out Warshawski as part of that. We bought Warshawski and took out the eminent eminent domain domain costs there. I mean, to be fair, maybe some of those things should have been done. I mean, that was a weird with with the, the, the Wyman curve and the, the one way there. It was just all weird. It but, was very weird. And but, we, I wanted a two-way conversion on South Main. But as I said last uh, Monday night at City Council, my fellow aldermen said no, and I respected that. They said, we can't spend the money on it now. So we spent the money because we were told, you got to move, you got to move. We've got these timelines with Gorman. We've got to get our part done. Gorman didn't live up to their pro- their portion. Not in one single area have they met their timeline. So now we're sitting here at the end of 16. The governor just yesterday, in fact, I think, signed the extension, extension of the state historic tax credit. Extension for River Edge. Right. I'm sorry. Move yeah. On his yeah. yeah. And that's, uh, you know, has other good benefits. What do you do with Gorman for 2017? They're supposedly bringing us back another package. I want to see what the what the ask is and what the what the offer is. Are they saying that uh, they've got new funding sources? What's the timeline? Is it June? Is it July? I'm not willing to wait for another two years. Well, I the, mean, we either move forward or we don't. The Register Star um, uh, had an editorial a, co- a couple of weeks ago, and, and I'm not sure if this was um, intentional. Um, I believe this was Brian Leaf's beat, and then he took a job in Beloit, and then a new reporter came in mm-hmm. and kind of leaked this thing out that it could happen in 2019. Well, if it happens in 2019, that kind of means that Gorman are start turning dirt over there t- to realize these tax credits, which, only, which to me, based on the old capital stack, is about 
about twelve million dollars. Twelve million you know, minus sixty-seven still leaves a, a pretty big hole oh, there. Pretty good. And there's thirty-three million dollars in the controversial EB five uh, program, which to me is a, is a complete sham. Um, and that, that, that's just how I look at things I now. Uh, th- there's eighteen million dollars that that could come from some capital investors, uh, uh, Berkshire Hath- uh, Hathaway, who might buy the tax credits or buy some of these credits, historic credits coming in there. So there's all this, uh, you know, these plates spinning, and. So to, to me, I mean, I'll just ask you, to, to me, it, it doesn't look like there's enough money based on the original capital stack. And I don't know what's going to happen with this new packet, but uh, can Rockford support a 150-room hotel downtown Rockford when 90% of our hotel stock is on the east side of town by I-90? And, and, and that, that's why I always question, why, why are we bringing Amtrak down here? We already have a Van Gelder bus uh, service. We, we have all these things that Rockford may in 30 years be ripe for. But r- right now, to me, putting a 156-room hotel downtown Rockford is 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 not only the cart before the horse is kind of insane to me i i don't I, maybe maybe i'm not looking at this correctly yeah if a business believes that there's enough development and enough future development that they want to be on the ground floor i'm all for it i'm just concerned about the amount of investment they're asking for from the city you know we also had some section 108 loans that's hud money that HUD guarantees it and and backs it. It's not coming. I'm sorry. The city guarantees it, that if they go belly up, we pay for it from our HUD funds, not from our city funds. Um, Jeez. Yeah. I I think you asked, what's what's the city's... The uh, Section 108 loans. What's the city's investment in the project at this point? I think it was Um, 20 million? It's most... No, goodness, no. no. The infrastructure was our big investment. And the big piece was going to be the parking deck, which was also going to support... Uh, the train uh, station for parking for the train. And by the way, the issue with the train, it's not so much the commute, I'm sorry, the passenger Amtrak rail. The ideal is to have commuter rail at some point uh, between Chicago and other parts, maybe Iowa, and that's for job purposes um, for me. If, If we can't, I believe there's a strong job base in Chicago I know that just from getting on the Van Gelder as much as I used to. The number of people who commute out to O'Hare Airport uh, in those places. Yes, they can catch the bus. I'd love to see them be able to do it on a high-speed commuter train, too. So if Gorman brings a package back, I I mean, it sounds like you're kind of in a wait-and-see mode on that. I'm in a wait-and-see mode, but I'm also very disappointed. Um, You know, we didn't get good feedback uh, the city, as I mentioned Monday night, was not exercising uh, its rights under the agreement to um, call a halt to it. You know, we have the 134 uh, North Main Street building. That's the one that J- Joseph James Partners with P- Peter Provenzano the was track, developing. The Trek Hotel? The old Trek. Um, that's at a standstill. That's at a halt. And yet we've got section 108 money that could be developing other businesses and attracting other businesses that we're not out there even out there trying for it so these projects either have to move um, or we have to say gee it just didn't work let's start looking for some new investors let's start looking at some new developers uh, for other areas that are going to bring jobs to rockford yeah, because we've been promised a few hotels, and we've seen none, just looking at the hotel piece of it. Right. But you're, so you're talking about we basically it's the opportunity cost we're losing out on Absolutely. kind of focusing for on other things areas. that could yes. happen yes. Uh, for things that have not happened. Yes. How, how easy would it be in terms of AMROC, you know, the Ziad building? I mean, to me, there's a climate that that's kind of um, ripe right now to, to be able to blame – well, you can blame Trump now because, as you said, uh, how friendly is he going to be? How to this friendly EB, is he going to be to EB five? And, and, and right now, um, you know, Rauner's taking a lot of heat for, you know, for for not passing this budget when it's really only you know partially his responsibility to do so. But to me, to, to me, you know, I mean, th- things sometimes. Um, politically speaking and economically speaking, are way left. Sometimes they're way right. We're seeing it way right now. Um, so it, to me, it would be very easy for people to just say, "Well, we're not going to do this project th- or that project." 
because it's 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 these guys. Look at these guys are doing to us. Poor Rockford again, and you know. So I don't know. How about municipal bankruptcy? I don't. What what, what do we do at this point? No, I'm not talking about municipal bankruptcy <laughs> at all. I mean that's just ridiculous. What I would like to do is Gorman owns the building. We did actually transfer ownership. Mm -hmm. So I would actually like to look at it and say to Gorman, hey, why don't we go out for another RFP? Yeah. Maybe you're not the best person to do this development. Let's see if there's really a stomach out there uh, with someone. They've done a lot of the environmental cleanup. We've gotten some other things in place. With the city's investment, I think it behooves us to see if there are other people who might want to take a look at that property now. All right. Right. Alderman, it's I feel like fun. I've kind of Thank monopolized yeah. the questions. No, I, no I, I feel like I've monopolized <clears throat> all the questions with your, because you've spoken out on many things, and, you know, so there there is these kind of finite things, but what should we know about you as a candidate and, and moving forward? I mean, what would you want people to hear? As a candidate, the thing I want people to know is that I do this because I really have an affinity for Rockford and for Southwest Rockford in particular. Um, it's ripe. The Morgan Street Bridge, the South Main Street redevelopment. Um, you have to be patient. It takes a while. If you get discouraged easy, this is not the business for you. Not in Southwest Rockford. You need to go out to the east side where it's a lot easier and uh, it happens overnight. Um, here, it's, it's, it's a marathon, not necessarily a sprint, but we're actually in you know, where you start off the race kind of fast, you know, and then mm -hmm. sort of bring it down a little bit later. I think we're in that fast part of the race now. So I want to keep moving. Um, we're looking at a health, bringing a health care facility to uh, that area of Southwest Rockford, um, working with Alderman Thompson Kelly and Alderman McNeely and Alderman Newberg and Alderman McConnell. She's just to the south of me. Mm -hmm. Our two areas join. What can we look at jointly? with the airport, um, is there a housing opportunity between the airport and South Main for that AAR facility? I believe there is. Um, market rate that reflects those thirty-five and $50,000 a year jobs. Um, it might not be in my ward, it might be further south on South Main, but that's okay because then they can come up on South Main to uh, eateries, to entertainment, those kinds of things. So. That's why I'm looking at another four years. Alderman, thanks so much for uh, braving the cold Thank to come you. visit us. Thank yes. you all. So we've really appreciated your, uh, your time and uh, your expertise. Uh, I learned several things in the conversation, <laughs> things I didn't know. So okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, it's been a blast. Great. Oh, I forgot to ask you, where can people find you? Oh, on the interwebs. Um, I am not, I do not have a website. Um, I'm, I'm a bit of a dinosaur. So I am setting up shortly after the first of the year a um, Facebook page. Right. So I will be getting that information out. Please but make sure we, you share that with Jim or me. And we'll I make absolutely sure that will. That gets disseminated out and uh, post we'll put it in the show notes yeah. and share that outward. So Thank you very know where much. To find you. Thanks so much for coming. Thank on. you guys. So Alderman McNamara was talking about school board members last week. He was, and that's a tough job. And I don't know if anybody saw the article. There's not the one famous. to fill. Yes, the, the famous South, Karina yeah. Curry wrote the article, right? Yes, I think the famous Karina Curry did write the article, telling us that there's nobody no wanting takers. to represent what, what, the what, Southwest Sub District. That's wow. That's uh, probably where um, uh, Renita is. I, I, I'm trying to think of who used to be the mem board Lisa member. Lisa Jackson there. was it? Lisa Jackson, I believe. Yeah, is the current board member from there? Yeah, she's she's pretty good. I don't know. Yeah. She's, she's stepping down. Yeah, I think she's tired. I think she's yeah. tired of running. I think she and her are sister are both teachers that. in the district. Uh, her indication in the article was that she's been telling people for a long time that she was not going to run and saying, hey, somebody better step up. And mm -hmm. apparently nobody stepped up. So I guess McNamara must be right. Uh, yeah. That must not be a fun task when absolutely well, now the nobody's board will willing to do it. Yeah, the board will just appoint somebody there. That's how it sounds. Yeah. Unless they write in. Though I don't know, can you win? Do you win with like one write-in vote? I don't know. I, I know that the school board is nonpartisan in a, as far as the elections go. Right, I, but I don't but know. I, I think if there's a write-in candidate, yeah, they did that one time. We need to find this, and, out. and I think they they, they so did. If there is they one have a special in. election. So if you, you write in, so you can so write in one person, and they'll. Well, I think. Let's do so it. if you write in Superman, Spider Man, Spider Man, like you'd write in Spider Man. I would. You're a Marvel Comics fan, okay. Yeah. I mean, what, 
We're going to have to find out more about this. Now, I'm just curious to know what happens. Well, if, we if there's no actual candidate, the one write-in vote wins it is if there is no other, or it's a battle of... I think I'll just ask the famous Karina Curry. Yeah. She, she's been on two forensic files now. I just know I, I ran across. Wow. Unbelievable. Wow. Yeah. She's super famous. She covered the Kevin Rice case and was on that episode of Forensic Files and the uh, Al Zulo hammer wielding murder. Mm. Mm. All right. Yeah. Everybody see Pecatonica is talking about doing a tiff to get a Dollar General. That's great. So, Haggerty, it's, I don't know what this they're means. They're tiffing I mean, out the county now. Yeah, they're going to tiff out Pecatonica. <laughs> I know you're worried about the tiffs. I'm worried about them. Oh, that reminds me. I ordered. So we've got the stand in. So I had to order the special display stand thing. Yeah. So we can put the TV right back here. I think we'll have it set up next week because I got the stand in yesterday. Unbelievable. So yeah, we're going to put that right back there and we can display. So it's not the, just a figment. The TIFF map. No, we're going to display the TIFF map. Yeah. It's going to be like the, can, the Mayberry map. You can <clears> point <throat> at the TIFFs. Can we all have pointer, pointers for it? Like, wow. Yeah, we'll get different color laser yeah, pointers. laser pointers. We'll get the colors to match our microphones. So orange, I don't think, is bad. So we're going to look like we red, know what we're talking red about. Red for Caleb, yeah. yeah that'll look very official as we talk about the TIFF. Well, Caleb right. is the one in... You guys are in real estate, so you guys can... So I didn't know if you... I thought you'd be excited that Pecatonica... TIFF's now, yeah, moving to Pecatonica. Well, they, they might... Um, maybe there's a need for, for that there. Where's this Dollar General going to be? Somewhere in Pecatonica. I mean, Pecatonica is not that is big. It, is it one road? It's one road, right? I mean, there's that's all Peck is. Is, is that that, <laughs> that one blighted other... lot they have there that needs to be rehabbed? I don't know. I don't we'll know. have to scrounge around further on I this. I suppose I can call the guy who runs Pecatonica and find out. Or we, may, maybe uh, Frank Haney could tell you, tell us some things about that. When he comes on, January 4th. I saw him today, by the way. Maybe maybe yeah. he... I uh... saw him today in one of his first uh, official... Um, official um, dates. He was at a press conference. Oh, I thought you meant date. But you said official <laughs> like you, dates. Well, he was out on a date. One of his official, uh, you know, he was in his, one of his very first official outings. An at, official at event. Okay. Events. Now I understand. In his capacity now as county board chairman. Yeah. Official dates. As Yeah. Not that kind of date. All right. Not like the Burnham Loft type of date. Not like Caleb goes on. <laughs> no. More people leaving Illinois than any other state. Yeah, I guess they're now. I didn't off. add this. This uh, WREX taking reports off. this. Caleb yeah. must have added I reported this. Reported it too. You reported? Did it you on? report it too? Well, I apologize. Well, RockfordAdvocate.com. You can get it there came too. Through, it came on a wire story, so I posted it. But it's a uh, yeah, hundred fourteen thousand people left, yeah. and that's more than any other state. It's, it's, it's to believe it's equivalent what was to put the, in the population of, of Peoria. Yeah, that, you're right. That's yeah. a pretty good yeah. chunk. <clears throat> So, I hey, guess. if we keep doing this, maybe we can get 114,000 people to leave Rockford. Okay. Keep doing the show right here. We'll drive them out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> get them out of here. Well, the, the, you know, half of the communities up in Roscoe are, are Rockford workers. No, I know. You know we've, dro- we've driven our police force out here. We've been driving around. No, and, that happened long before no, we started I this but, I mean, it, it's, that, that's really a, not a, a, a testament to anything terrible in Rockford. It's a, you know. A place to build a nice suburban house. What about teachers? Should teachers live in? I don't know. In the school district. In the school district. Yeah, I think everybody should have to I live. You're getting paid by the taxpayer. Yes. By the taxpayer. Yes. I guess I'm a mercantilist that mercantilist. way. Mercantilist. I yeah. guess I maybe think a, that maybe a socialist. To to Alderman Herbie's point, I think you keep the money where the in the tax district it's coming from. I agree. Well, I don't they, think it's, they, and it's no. not outrageous. And, and to Tokars' point, because I get that point. I mean, that's like the poor people who have to work in Aspen, you know, and you make like $8 an hour. Right. You can't live in Aspen on $8 an hour. It, you know, he raised that point relative to Gurney, and I, th- I do think that makes sense there. But, but here, Rockford that, has lots of, the choices. Well, it yeah. makes sense. lots of choices. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense in, in, a, in a largely, like, well, Los Angeles, Chicago, where you have all these communities jammed into one little area, and you call it Chicago or greater Los yeah, Angeles. that's true. I mean, then, you know, someone's going to live in, Different communities, right. but Rockford is. But here, I, I don't think it would be asking too much to live within the geographic confines. But, I mean, of I, yeah, to require Rockford. it, to require it, I, I don't know that I would. I would. I mean, it's not your. Fight it's not nail for private that. money you're getting paid by. Mm-hmm. It's public. It's public taxpayer money. Yeah. But right? I think the state I mean, has take pretty much taken ownership of that. Unions have taken ownership of that. Wow. I wonder if Home Rule would solve that problem. If Home Rule would solve that problem, you might get me back on board now. with it. Hmm? We've got home rule now. It's backdoor home rule with tips. And <laughs> We've talked about this. Backdoor <laughs> home rule. If you really want home rule, then. Now we're going to go there. All right. Urban Farming Ordinance Review. 
Wow. Caleb? Yeah. Urban farming, like gardening? Well, it, does this relate to this poor guy who no. builds basically a big farm up off, what, Landstrom Road near Forest Hills Country Club? Yeah, right around that area. That guy. That guy. Yeah. So about... Two or three months ago, was it three? Well, three months yeah, ago. Yeah, in the probably. summer. In the summer, right? This poor guy is getting shaken down by the city because he has too big of a garden mm. on a residential plot. Well, the the problem was so he was farming in his parents' backyard, and then he was renting a plot of land, probably a couple blocks away from where he was his parents' house was. So this other plot of land that he was renting out from somebody, it was vacant plot of land. He was using it as more farmland. So he was growing, I don't know, lettuce and lettuce. other other types of greens and whatnot. And he was selling he sells it to Prairie Street Brew House and oh. Octane and um, other places down here and and then I guess somebody called the city on him because there was not like when it when it's the acreage is so big or if the plot's so big and there's not a building on it, it's no longer considered gardening, it's considered farming. Like, Cropping or you yeah, know, farming. But so there, there are, there are s- aren't there some properties in Rockford though that are grandfathered out of that type of ordinance? Because, I think because you go over by Guilford, there's guy has horses on his backyard, and I think those are older properties that used to be farms. But is that co- some of that's well, some is some county. county. That's right? true. The county line. Some of that's county. That's right? weird. But even all that aside. Could this possibly be the biggest thing we have to worry about in this city? I I mean, the city actually responds to this. Has what a code enforcement officer respond to this? And I like the code enforcement officers. They're they're in my experience, they're decent, diligent guys and ladies who you know if they identify something, you call them and say, "Here's a deal." It's a decent conversation, and they're doing a job. My problem isn't with them. I guess my problem is with the structure of in a city with a massively high violent crime rate. We're actually consumed with the notion of, hey, what should we worry about today? Well, well, let's see. Let's dedicate some time to making sure this guy doesn't have too much garden stuff on a residential plot. So you're sending code enforcement officers to mess around with this when there's probably restaurants all over Rockford with fire hazards and grease on the floor. I, mean, there's, uh, I don't even there's, want there's, them doing there's, that. Well, I don't I mean, even but, want them doing there's, that. There's, prob- I mean, there's as problems. As far as I'm concerned, problems. yeah, there's real problems and real problems with people using right. guns and people mugging people and people shooting people and people robbing banks. I mean, solve those problems. I, I guess if we get all the other things taken care of, then we can dial it down. And I understand the broken window theory. I mean, James Q. Wilson and that whole thing, that was all big when I was an undergrad. But let's be real about this. I mean, this is like worrying about you know, I've got some type of, you know, skin issue on the back of my hand. Uh, meanwhile, we're having a heart attack. Right. You know, it's like, well, what are we going to worry about today? Well, should, let's worry about this guy in his garden. Should we allow uh, chicken coops in the city? Yeah, I like city chickens. Yeah. And people can have fresh well, eggs. monkeys. Like monkeys? Well, not mean ones. Right. Not like the Fairla- <laughs> Fairdale mean monkey. Did you pull out my story on that? Did you? What? The original story? Yeah. No. The lady was was quite miffed about her dead monkey. All right, we're going to anyway, put the, we'll we'll put the link chicken. to that in Let's this. Talk episode. about agricultural issues now. The, 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 this guy who was obviously just, you know, ruining the landscape of Rockford with his with his mom's with his yard. Out, this outrageous farming. <laughs> yeah. He's probably the prices of lettuce is probably too high. They're probably mad at him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> cornering, probably wouldn't. cornering the market on, on, on <laughs> produce. Yeah, his uh, his quality produce is. Probably, uh, guys are probably going to find me and kill me now. I said that to him. Said that about him. Just like Eli's coming on, he he has some sort of nefarious motive. What do you think, Eli's going to come know. in here and... Well, you're the one who like, insulted him. I like the guy. No. <laughs> well, I don't dislike Eli. All right. I just, anyway, let's get back to it. The, the, I just would take a different approach to dealing with things like Mike Dunn than Eli has, but that's fine. We'll talk about that next week, yeah. December 28th. Eli Nicolosi and you have another guest lined up, James. Who is that? I don't know. I have an, another guest? I thought you for next week, or am I off a week? I think it might be off a week. Oh, the 28th, maybe I'm off the 28th a week. is, um, when is Haney coming on? The 4th of right, January. The 4th, and I believe the 11th is a, um, a special guest to talk about. Oh, uh, David Soul's rights. coming on. David oh, Soul's coming on. Yeah. Sorry. So he's your From Wolf's Park, right? That's, Park. that's right. Yes. Very interesting guy. Loves that Bernie. Jake the Snake Morgan has no substantial Viking update well, uh, from Guilford, but he did make us these very nice coasters. He made those of you, a, now, those of you listening, now watching, we're, we're dealing here. These coasters, just to be clear, these things are like, what, an in, over an inch yeah, thick? Yeah, probably about an inch and a half. Is this oak? 
It is. Yeah, these are nice. This is nice stuff. Very hard. It's hardwood. Is there like a principal's desk at uh, Guilford missing, or where'd you <laughs> where'd you get all this wood, Jake? Really? Yeah. Do they have a wood shop there? Yeah. Really? So Jake made these. Thank you, Jake. It's quality workmanship right yeah. there. All right. You should emblazon them with like a Viking logo. Oh, the right. next ones will be better. So these are just test prototype mm-hmm. ones. So what other newsworthy items do you have? That's on the, it. On the iPad. That's all. Really. That's all the You're news. You're not going to make fun of me or anything? That's all the news that's fit to print. Yeah. No more than usual. Right. Uh, no talk oh. about this pack today. No, you we didn't discuss asked. the pack. That's because James has been busy with a new project. Rockford Advocate is launching uh, a different investigation apart from the Super Pack. Well, the super, they, they, they didn't need an investigation. Well, no, that what's, just is what it is. is what what's it is. this other inves- investigation? Well, I don't know who remembers the Jennifer Lockmiller murder. Oh, geez. Oh, but I think the, the Alan Beeman case. Yes. Otherwise question, known as. Yes, yes. The question there would be, if Alan Beeman didn't do it, who did? Who did? That, that's an interesting question because there's, uh, there, were, there were other suspects, as you may know, uh, two or three. Uh, one, right. I think, was Bubba. His name was Bubba Gates. Bubba. Um, they, they, they named him... I believe now he's he's been eliminated. Um, there's hundreds of pages of deposition uh, that are pretty interesting. And, All right, you know, so you know, we can. Alan Beeman is back in Rockford. He's moved on with his life, and uh, you know he, I think, has since received a full pardon. Uh, yeah, I think he was exonerated. exonerated. Uh, would be the yeah. There was a it's a judgment of innocence or something to that effect. And there's, there's absolutely no doubt that, that, that he's innocent. In that. And, and it's all public now. He, he wasn't even well, there. Well, I'm not trying to be a naysayer. I mean, there's, he's been cleared. Right. I mean, I, I don't think he did it. I, just mean, I, mean, I don't know how any of us know with anything with any certainty unless you were there on the scene. But, well, but yes, we, we all what? have no, now no reasonable basis to believe that right. he did it. Right. So and then, and then there's there's two other cases that I'm that I'm working on like that kind of quasi unsolved murders. So yeah, I'm I'm, I'm going to try to what do we say? So Rockford drill, Advocate, drill. I was going to ask. I was going to say I was going to drill into it, or I can't say dig. Drill down on it. Yeah, if I say dig deep, get it, down on it. Yeah. Get down on it. And getting down on it. The gap band. Get to might the bottom of it. We say that the Gap Band, but so we can't say cool get down the on gang. it. Or who sang that song? Get down get on it. Get down on it. No, I don't know. Uh, so I know you, the song. I don't know. Who now sang now it. that you, you you sung it, we're probably going to have a YouTube well, copyright YouTube, in for Yeah, I was going to say YouTube will just knock this episode right off now. That's right. Uh, Th- those bands are probably broke anyway. They need they need some royalties. Yeah, the fifteen so, cents that they're going to earn from you singing it. So whatever it is we do, actually, whatever Rockford Advocate does, I'm not even sure you do what we do because we get to the bottom of it, right? Is that what we decided? Well, I'm trying to get to the bottom of a yes. few things, a couple of these unsolved cases. Well, you, know. <laughs> you can't get to the bottom. That's ours. Well, that's yeah. that's from this show. Okay. Well, you're, there he's our media partner, Caleb. Should we let him? Should we let Rockford Advocate say get to the bottom of it? Mm. Well, that's not original, though. I mean, everybody. I suppose digging deeper is not as original as no. they like to think, is it? I don't know. I don't know. You can borrow know. it for a little. Whatever bit. Whatever we do, well. yeah. Whatever we do, <laughs> Haggerty is going to do that to these unsolved murder cases. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and I'm going to be all over the uh, the Stephen Avery, Brendan Dassey stuff that's currently in the works with you know a, a Chicago lawyer is t- kind of taking over a part of that. Um, so I've got my own little angle on that. And then there's another one, but an Illinois case that I've been working on for like ten years. It's a real, it's a strange one because the, the key people have died in this, um, aside from the, 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 the victim who disappeared. So th- th- those two are going to be kind of you know ongoing. But but I think the the the, the Lock Miller is one that's really interesting to me. All right, interesting. Well, we'll see where that goes in weeks ahead. Anybody else got anything important? That's it. Where can we find Ice you, Josh? Hogs tonight? Ice Hogs tonight. Oh, that reminds me. Ice yeah. Hogs update. Right now they're skating against the Chicago Wolves. Oh. I don't know. Keep checking it out. Oh, that's right. This is, this is, is this Bomber Hat Night? Yeah, Bomber Hat Night. Yeah, this is. is Bomber Hat yeah. Night. There's 1,500 tonight. people just acting like lunatics right now. No, right? 1,497 because right. we took three hats. We did. Yep. So, and I, I don't know if that's wolf hair in there or not. I think it may be. That's something. It's, it's, it's something, it's something. Uh, it's magical. But it, it, uh, they won two games last week. They're back in the win column. So. That's fantastic. Well, that's great news. So, yeah, we're happy to hear that. Yeah, it was a little bit of a skid for a while. Yeah. 
So yeah. So speaking of skids, I'll skid back down to the game after. Skid back down to the game, and people. <laughs> want I already it. had a pulled pork for for dinner down there, courtesy of the ice hogs. And a, it never occurred to me they eat they eat pork products. Well, How does Hammy feel about that? Well, you of course, know, I guess pigs eat each other, right? Pigs are cannibals. Well, I, I think they would eat anything, wouldn't they? Yeah. So I guess they wouldn't care. I, I, I haven't eating. asked Hammy, um, but, but we, I was thinking about having Hammy on, but Hammy does not talk, so. Well, I don't know. That's all right. We can work around that. Yes, we could. Yeah, there's yeah. Uh, different sorts of visual cues. Well, as long we as we don't use. like, you know, take a bite out of Hammy's leg in a, in a moment of desperate I'm not messing hunger. with Hammy. Hammy's Hammy's large. Well, six four at least. No, well, maybe seven four. Hammy seven, could probably four. dunk a basketball. I would think. Really? You think, you think he, maybe. Wow, Hammy's huge. Yeah. All right. No message to Hammy. So, Haggerty, we can find at rockfordadvocate.com and the Ice Hogs game. Well, thank you, James Haggerty, Caleb Wilson, Jake, the Snake, Morgan, and the production chair. I am Jeff Orduno, and that was This Week in Rockford.